Yeehaw! Welcome to your lesson on Earth's motion. All right, so before we get super far into Earth's motion, we have to kind of go over some of the basics. Um, astronomy. So we've started to touch on astronomy um, with the Big Bang Theory and Hubble's Law, and we got into the electromagnetic spectrum and redshift and blue shift, and now we're moving into uh, the motion of Earth. And astronomy is the study of the universe. And throughout history, the Greeks were really prominent in astronomical discoveries. The first thing that we need to talk about is two different models, the geocentric model and the heliocentric model. The geo, the term, the prefix geo means Earth. And so therefore the geocentric model has the Earth being at the center of the solar system. So the moon, the sun, and the planets orbit the Earth with this model. The heliocentric, helio is a prefix that means sun, is the sun-centered model. This is where the Earth, the moon, and the other planets orbit the sun. Okay, so you can see here the Earth is at the center of the solar system, and everything else is orbiting the Earth. And here you can see the sun is at the center of the solar system and everything else in the solar system, all the planets and the moon are orbiting the sun. This is the, this is the correct model. The geocentric was the earliest model, and then the heliocentric um, was proposed and people fought it, and then over time, um, as telescopes were used and more and more data was gathered, it was proven that the planets are actually orbiting the sun and not the other way around. So we have some laws of planetary motion. So remember, we're going back to the difference between theories and laws, which we started off Earth science with. Um, laws can be proven. Theories are widely accepted. So this nice fine fellow over here, Mr. Kepler, he used math to discover three laws of planetary motion. And remember, I like to say math is the language of science. Math is what is usually used to prove different things in science. Um, and so his three laws I'm going to go over, and I've got some diagrams for each of them. The first law is that the path of each planet around the sun is in the shape of an ellipse. Ellipse is like an egg, a sort of egg-shaped. So the, pl the path of each planet around the sun makes the same shape, and that shape is in the form of... So here we have this egg shaped, that's an ellipse. Every planet that goes around the sun, it goes around the sun in that same exact shape. His second law um, is a little bit harder to understand. I have a nice diagram that goes with it in just a second. Um, each planet revolves so that an imaginary line connecting it to the sun sweeps over equal areas and equal time intervals. And that probably makes no sense, so just hang tight for the diagram. What it means is that the planets travel faster when they're closer to the sun and slower when they're farther away from the sun. So if you look at that, you can see on the left side of the screen, um, you can see the planet, the little dot on the left, and then you can see the sun. That planet is moving faster when it's closest to the sun. If you look at that planet on the right side of the screen, planet Y, that planet is moving slower because it's farther away from the sun. And what do you think might cause a planet to move faster or slower based on its distance from the sun? Think about that, and we'll come back to it. And also look at the size difference in the sun and the planet and think about how that might affect its speed. All right, Kepler's third law, the length of time that it takes a planet to orbit the sun and its distance to the sun are proportional. So what that means is the farther away from the sun, the longer it's going to take to orbit it. And at the same time, that also means the closer it is to the sun, the shorter that it's going to take to orbit it. So here we have a fancy 
fancy graph. We have the period in years along the x-axis and then dist di the distance from the sun in what are called AUs. These are astronomical units. Um, AUs measure very, 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 very large distances. So we can see that it is, we have a linear relationship here. We've got the distance and the period proportional. So we could actually create slope here for this and fi figure out what the slope of this line is for all the planets orbiting the sun from Mercury all the way up to Pluto, which is the farthest away. Mercury is the closest. So if you look at distance, Mercury is about 0.5. It's about half under one. And it takes the shortest amount of time to orbit. Whereas if you go up to Jupiter, Jupiter, I'd say, is about an 8 in astronomical units and about an 11 in period. So the farther away the planet gets, the longer it takes for it to orbit. And that's what his third law states. Okay, so moving into motion of the Earth. Um, rotation, we have a, several new vocab words coming up, and rotation is the first one. So rotation is the turning or spinning of a body on its axis. So the Earth is spinning around in a circle. So if we were standing in place, standing, and we just stood in the same spot but turned around in a circle, that would be an example of rotation. Earth's rotation is what makes day and night. So one rotation equals 24 hours. One rotation equals a day. Okay, so here's an example of the direction of rotation, north, south, west, and east. The Earth rotates in a counterclockwise motion, so like going backwards around the clock from 12 to 11 to 10 to 9 to 8 to 7 to 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Whereas revolution is the motion of a body or a planet along a path around some point in space. So Earth revolves around the sun, and the moon revolves around the Earth. The time it takes for Earth to revolve around the sun is approximately 365.25 days. And we're going to do seasons in just a little bit, but the reason that we have a leap year is we have one extra day every four years, because if you add that .25 up, 0.25 plus 0.25 plus 0.25 plus 0.25 every four years you have one full extra day because 0.25 times four is one and that would create an extra day every fourth year that's where leap year comes from so a little bit more about earth's position is um, there's a couple vocab words aphelion and perihelion look at the prefixes a and peri um, the aphelion is the point on Earth's orbit, or the point on its orbit where Earth is farthest from the sun. So A, you can help remember this by A away, uh, the point where it's farthest away from the sun. In perihelion, the point on its orbit when Earth is closest to the sun. Um, helion, the prefix helion, remember we had... Um, Earlier in the lesson, we talked about helio equaling sun. A helion is the nucleus of a helium-3 atom. Um, helium-3 is another type of a helium atom. It's, a, um, it's where the neutrons have changed. So perihelion, you can see um, where it's closest. So on the very left-hand side of the screen, that left-hand arrow, when the Earth is at that spot, it's closest to the sun, whereas when it's on the right side of the screen, it's farthest away from the sun. And remember, when it's farthest away from the sun, it's moving slower. When it's closer to the sun, it's moving faster. Okay, another word is precession. Um, this diagram is fantastic to help explain precession um, and a precession is the change in the direction of the axis but it doesn't actually change the degree of the tilt so earth is tilted on its axis and if you look in this diagram at the bottom of the screen you see 23 and a half degrees earth is tilted on its axis 23 and a half degrees so if you had earth standing up straight and then you tipped it over to the right 23 and a half degrees 
That's how Earth is all the time. Um, precession is where the ax, the direction of the axis changes, but the tilt does not change. So right now, Earth's axis is pointing towards the star you see, which is called Polaris. That's the North Star. In 13,000 years from now, however, Earth's axis is going to be pointing somewhere near Vega. You see that on the top left hand of the screen. The direction of the tilt is never going to change. It's still 23 and a half degrees. Just the the change in the axis will, will shift. So that changes what stars are going to be above or going to be up in our night sky and up near the now, nutation. So we have Earth. It's tilted on its axis. As Earth is rotating and revolving, it's wobbling. And this wobble actually does create a little change in the angle. So the 23 and a half degree angle can shift a half degree one way or the other. And this occurs over an 18 year period. And so it happens really slowly, a half degree over 18 years. And it happens because of the gravitational pull between the Earth and the Moon. And we're going to get into seasons again in a later, a later lesson coming up. But the reason we have seasons is because of this 23 and a half degree tilt. It has everything to do with the amount of solar radiation we get from the sun. And if we're shifting a degree one way or the other, it's going to have a slight increase or decrease on seasons as well. All right, the last part of this lesson is something called barycenter. So barycenter is basically the point between two objects where they balance each other out. And you guys are going to do an awesome lab on this that really helps explain barycenter um, in a really easy way to visualize it. So, for example, it's the center of mass where you have two or more celestial bodies, bodies orbiting each other. When a moon orbits a planet or a planet orbits a star, both of those things are actually orbiting around a point, like an imaginary point that lies outside the center of that actual thing. Um, that um, is because as things move, there's gravitational pull, which pulls it just outside the center of that actual body. So this diagram is using the sun. This is this is a very great diagram to help explain this. The sun is not actually stationary in our solar system. It's not just sitting there. It moves a little bit as the planets tug on it. And as the planets tug on it, it causes the sun to orbit the solar system's barycenter. The sun doesn't ever stray too far from the solar system's barycenter. But if you look at this diagram, you can see the sun on the left. And then you can see Jupiter and Saturn um, on the right-hand side. And you can see the barycenter. That's like the very center where it balances out. And that has to do with the size of the sun and the size of the planets that are tugging on the sun um, and its gravity, gravitational pull.